<laughs> Hello and welcome to our Exodus Bible study. We have had a, uh, quite a break since our last Bible study, and I'm also very excited to be back here uh, in the studio filming. Uh, we finished up the book of Genesis in March, and now the school year has started. Uh, we're in the middle of September, and we are kicking up again our Through the Bible study. My name is Dave Bigler. If this is your first study uh, of Iron Sheep Ministries, thank you for joining us. I'm going to give a, a quick explanation of who I am, what is my theological perspective, uh, why should we study the Bible, specifically what we're going to be doing each week, and then we're going to dig into uh, the first chapter of Exodus. We will do a little bit of a background on Genesis first. Uh, and the Pentateuch. So first of all, who am I? My name is Dave Bigler. I'm with Iron Sheep Ministries, and I'm a Bible teacher. The goal of this is for you to join me as we dig into Scripture, as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, uh, opening this up to see what does God say to us. From a theological standpoint, I am a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, uh, evangelical. Uh, the, the church that I attend is a Calvary Chapel, but for the past 20-plus years, I've attended non-denominational churches. I believe that this is God's Word for us. Uh, Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. I also believe that uh, in the inerrancy of Scripture, and what I mean by that to clarify is that the original text handwritten by original authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was without error. Now that being said, that was some 3,500 years ago to 2,000 years ago uh, that these 66 books were written. So while the original autographs were without error, uh, they were in uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And we don't have the original manuscripts. Uh, we have... Without question, we have accuracy in our scripture, and I'm not going to go into textual criticism, which is an awesome subject to discuss, uh, but the Bible that I hold is God's word to us. There might be some textual uh, translational issues of A's versus ums and that sort of thing, but as you look at textual criticism through the thousands of years, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that the Bible that I hold, and if you are using a modern translation, whether it's a King James, New King James, NIV, ASB, NASB, any of those, uh, it conveys God's message to us. There might be subtle differences. I do a separate video. I did a separate video on translations, and I will include that at the end, but already I'm spending way too much time on this. The point being is, is this is God's word, and it's beneficial for us to study it. I also think that it's important to study the whole thing. Uh, and that's the reason why God put it on my heart three years ago in July of 2020 to start doing an expository through the Bible study. We started with Matthew. Uh, and then after we finished Matthew, we went on to Acts. And then we finished Acts and we went on to Romans. Then we went to Genesis. And uh, the 50 chapters of Genesis took us nearly a year to go through. And we're going to start up Exodus today. There are... Uh, 40 chapters in Exodus, and likely this is going to take us roughly 40 weeks to go through. There are some chapters that um, we, we might be able to condense down, but there's others that might take a little bit longer. My goal here is not to try to wow you or to come up with um, crazy, awesome application every single time of the five tips on how to be the better you. If that's what you're looking for, this is the wrong study. The goal here is to open up the Bible and to learn about God's character. Uh, and I think that covers um, our introduction. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we study it. That's why it's good to memorize it. I am not an expert. Uh, I do have a master's in biblical studies, uh, but I'm no Bible theologian. Uh, uh, there are many, many people that are far smarter than me. 
So I do rely on commentaries and I will put in the notes for each study in the description if I use a, a reference, um, even if I don't cite it uh, verbally as quoting from it, but if I did use it as background, I will cite it in there. Um, and I will give uh, my insight, but really the goal here is the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So my goal is to simply shed light and learn and you join along with me. As was the case for the very first study we did on Matthew 1. If one person benefits from this study that we're recording right here, right now, my purpose has been met. So uh, I'm going to pray and we're going to dig into Exodus chapter 1. But first we'll do a little bit of an overview on the Pentateuch and Genesis, etc. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this text. Thank you for uh, allowing us the time to now study it. Thank you that you care about us and that you've given us this. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just create us and leave us be, that you are active in our lives and that we can call on you, that we can pray to you, and that you want us to learn about your character. I pray right now, Lord, that you will speak through me, that you will open up the ears and soften the hearts of those people that are listening or watching right now, and that together we will uh, learn something new about your character. Praise you, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, for this time. We dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, Exodus is a continuation of Genesis. In fact, um, in Hebrew, I got to make sure I follow my notes, otherwise I'm going to go all over the place. Um, I'm jumping ahead. So the, the opening of Exodus, the very first word in Hebrew is and. It, 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 Exodus is not a separate book as much as it's another chapter. So the first five books of the Bible, uh, and this is likely review for many, um, are what is called the Pentateuch or the Torah, depending on your perspective. Pentateuch is the Greek word for five. Uh, and Torah is the same five books of the Hebrew Bible. It's the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they go one right into another, uh, all the way through to Deuteronomy. Uh, as we study, uh, context is critical. Context always informs meaning. So you can take a single verse out of the Bible and you can make it say pretty much anything you want it to say. But the key thing to studying and understanding the perspective is context. So before we dig into Exodus, I need to give a quick explanation of uh, Genesis. Uh, Genesis is the beginning. It is the story of creation. But very quickly you go from creation and the fall to Adam and Eve. And, and very quickly you get to Noah and then the flood. And then you get into the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. After Jacob, you have the 12 sons. Joseph is the second youngest of the 12 sons. And from Genesis 37 through 47, really through 50, is the story of uh, Joseph being sold as a slave by his loving brothers and going down to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house. Uh, he ends up being accused of rape and ends up in prison. He interprets some dreams for the baker and the um, cupbearer. And it's through that interaction that he goes in front of Pharaoh himself, the king of Egypt. And through God, he's able to interpret a dream that Pharaoh had two dreams. And these dreams are a vision given by God of what is going to happen in the future to Egypt. Seven years of, of a feast and plenty followed by seven years of famine. So uh, Joseph advises Pharaoh to put somebody in charge of all of the food in Egypt so that in the years of plenty, they can store it up so that they have food in the years of, of need. Pharaoh likes the idea and he puts Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. The only person that is more powerful than him is uh, Pharaoh himself. Canaan, where Jacob, his father, is, the famine is so bad that they're without food as well. So in a series of events that takes place across multiple, multiple chapters, uh, Jacob and his other 11 sons end up coming down to Israel. And as we, excuse me, coming down to uh, Egypt. But that was actually pretty good. Israel, I need to say, um, Israel is the name that God gave to Jacob. 
He changed his name to Israel. And there's times in the Bible in which um, the Bible refers to Jacob as Jacob, and there's other times at which he's referred to as Israel. But in Exodus, we see Israel for the first time referred to as a nation or a people group. So that is a very quick summary of Genesis. An important thing to note is the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant um, is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 12. It's then in 15 and 17. And in fact, before we open up Exodus, let's open up Genesis. Um, go to Genesis chapter 12. I'll give you a second to get there. Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read the Abrahamic covenant. This is absolutely critical uh, for Israel as a nation. This is a covenant that is an unconditional covenant. It is made between God and Israel as a nation. At this point, it's just Abraham. Uh, but join me, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. That's the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant given by God to Abram at the time. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And from you, all peoples on earth will be blessed. This is an everlasting covenant that is still in existence today. But the blessing that is on all people through the Abrahamic covenant, is Jesus. Jesus Christ is a descendant of Israel. He is a Jew. He is of the tribe of uh, Judah, of the 12 sons. So you have Abraham. Then this covenant was then passed on to his son and reaffirmed to his son Isaac. And then it was passed on to his son Jacob. And then Jacob had the 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. And they travel down to Egypt. So as we open up and flip over to Exodus chapter 1, the Hebrew that is here, um, the text actually says, and these are the names. And that's actually the title of this book in Hebrew is um, the book of names. Often uh, the Hebrew scholars, they would name the books based off of simply the first sentence. And so Exodus is not Exodus in the Hebrew Bible. It's um, the book of names is what it's called. So uh, join me as we read Exodus 1, 1 through 17. Excuse me. Exodus 1, 1 through 7. It's been six months that I've been off. I got to get back into the swing of doing these Bible studies. I apologize. Uh, Exodus 1, 1 through 7. Join me as we read. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Okay, let's dig into this. So the way these studies go is that we are going to read every single word in Exodus. We're going to go through every single verse, and what I'm going to do is break it down. So we'll do one chunk, then I'll talk about that. And then we'll do another chunk, and I'll talk about that until we get to the end of the lesson for that, that day. And at the end, I will do application. One thing to note on application, I am not going to, and I might have already mentioned this, I'm not going to... Uh, fish and try to find meaning that's not necessarily there, especially in these uh, books of history. These are not journalistic points on history. These are theological points on history. So the original author of the Pentateuch is Moses. Moses wrote all five books. He wrote them during the desert wanderings in this period after the Exodus, when they leave Egypt and they wander in the desert for 40 years, it's in that time frame that he writes down Genesis, 
uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The original audience was those people, the people of Israel that traveled and wandered in the desert. And as we begin the first book after the Pentateuch is the story of Joshua. Joshua is uh, Moses' assistant that then takes over control right as they are then able to go across the Jordan and start to take possession of the promised land. That promised land which was given in the Abrahamic covenant outlined, I believe, in either Genesis 17, 15. 15 is the outlining of the land. 17 is the covenant of circumcision. So the, the point being is, is that like when you look and study this, these are events that really did happen. But the point here is not to establish a historical record of events, though it does do that for us. But it, it's not a journalistic history. If it were, there'd be some very specific points that would be given. Uh, uh, times, dates, names. We know, for example, that Pharaoh is the king in Egypt. And we'll see that, that one Pharaoh is going to die and another Pharaoh is going to replace him in the timeline here, but we don't know which Pharaoh it is. We don't know the exact time at which the Exodus happened. We do know that it did happen though, but we are given significant and important information. The goal of Exodus is to show us God's character and his uh, um, rescuing us. And I'll get into that. I'm jumping all over the place, but I need to get back to my notes. I just wanted to give that context of understanding and application. I'm not going to look at the plagues that we're going to hit uh, uh, soon enough and try to somehow get application of the gnats. The, the plague of gnats means this for today, and the plague of frogs means this for today. Um, no. Uh, as far as application is going to be far more simple of that, of simply saying, okay, this is what the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write for the original Israelite people that were traveling and wandering through the desert. Based on that context, what can we apply to us today? And we'll hit that at the end. Okay, so verse 1, uh, and these are the names. Um, as I already mentioned, the Hebrew uh, title of this book is These Are the Names, or the Book of Names. Um, and as I already mentioned, the first word of this book is and. Um, this is actually a common thing. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, all the original Hebrew words in them begin with and. And as we read, these are the names of the sons of Jacob uh, uh, that came down to Egypt. I mean, you're starting in the middle of the story. We're jumping right into the middle of the story here. Uh, interesting thing to note, verse 1 through, um, 1 through 6, excuse me, this opening line. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob. That is an exact uh, replica of Genesis 46, 8. Exact same sentence, exact same thing in Genesis 46, 8. The difference then is that in Genesis 46, these are the names of the sons that were going down, whereas this is these are the names of the sons who went down. It's the only difference. Um, another thing to note, verse 7 the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. I found this very interesting, this word fruitful. The Hebrew word is sarets, and it's translated as swarm. So uh, the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, and the description of this word can mean a swarm. It's also used uh, several times in Genesis, Genesis 120 and 121. Uh, in creation, and as well as Genesis 7, 21, 8, 17, and Genesis 9, 7. Genesis 9, 7 is God actually saying to Noah uh, a command given to him to go forth and, and be fruitful, multiply, be abundant. God is commanding both. Uh, he gives the command to Adam uh, at the beginning, and then he gives the command to Noah and then he also gives the same similar command to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to go forth and multiply. It's an important thing to note. This is God's decree for his people is as the Abrahamic covenant says, God is going to turn them into a mighty nation. And a swarm is, uh, I mean, when we get to the end of Exodus, you're going to see that uh, there's more than 2 million people traveling together through the desert. 
and from the top of Mount Sinai looking down, it would look like a swarm. Absolutely would look like a swarm. I just thought that was interesting that that, that Hebrew word means swarm. Exodus 12, 37, um, at the time of their departure from Egypt, so not now um, in our story because Moses hasn't even been born yet, but when they depart uh, from Egypt, and we'll hit it in Exodus 12, 37, the Bible tells us that there were 600,000 Hebrew men. That is where we get the number uh, 2 million uh, as an estimate of how many people there were between the women and children. If there's 600,000 men, it's likely 2 million in total that, that were the Hebrew Israelite slaves um, in Egypt that when they left Egypt, that's how many were traveling, which is amazing. It's a, a, a mighty swarm, a great host. You can see God is making good on his promise in the Abrahamic covenant. Additionally, the Abrahamic covenant given in Genesis 12, I already mentioned that, um, that the Abrahamic covenant makes it clear that God is going to make them into a mighty nation, and that's what we see happen here. Um, so the Israelites are fulfilling God's command in Genesis 9-7 given to Noah to go forth and be fruitful and increasing abundantly, and it's also following the Abrahamic covenant. But Pharaoh doesn't like God's plan, and we're going to read about that. Um, it's an interesting thing to note uh, as we go on, who is the antagonist in this story? Make note of it. Make note of it. Um, as we study more and more, we're going to see that um, Pharaoh wants to go against God's decree. And so we see God use his creation to go against Pharaoh. The plagues that we're going to see, the splitting of the Red Sea that we're going to see, all these things are God using his creation to battle and to show his power with the king of Egypt who uh, is in defiance of God and who wants to go against God's creation. So God uses his creation against him. Okay, let's keep reading. Uh, verse 8 through 14. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Verse 14, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Okay, so let's dig into this. A new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. That's in verse 8. So this is a new pharaoh. We do not know what this pharaoh's name is. Now, uh, archaeologists have, uh, and, and biblical scholars and textual critics, etc., cetera, um, have estimations of which pharaoh it is. Um, and I'll leave that for them to say. But the important thing here is, is that it's a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. Now, one of two things is happening here. Either so much time has passed that the story of Joseph has been forgotten, or more likely the story of Joseph is well known, but this new Pharaoh just simply does not care. Joseph was a Hebrew, an Israelite that saved Egypt. God used Joseph to save Egypt. And Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Joseph's day, opened up the land and invited the Israelites in. In fact, they welcomed him, them in as shepherds because the Egyptians detested shepherds. They hated that as, as far as a, uh, a career, as, as far as a uh, a lifestyle as being a shepherd was detestable. So great. Yeah. If you guys want to be shepherds, you can be the shepherds of um, all of Pharaoh's cattle, everything. You're welcome. Come on in. Now a great deal of time has passed. We do not know how much time has passed. We do know from scripture, uh, Exodus 1240, that the total time of Israel in captivity, not, excuse me, 
not in captivity, but simply in Egypt is 430 years. So a long time has passed. A great many years have, has passed since Joseph uh, did the great things that he did with God's uh, using him. So now this Pharaoh doesn't care about that. And the, what is the number one threat? The threat is the volume of people. Because if the Israelites decide to band together, they outnumber, I don't know that, excuse me, but their number is so great that it would be a great threat to the Egyptians. And so that is the threat, is the number of people. Another interesting thing to note, verse 9, this is the first time in the Bible that Israelites, uh, Israel is referred to as a people group as opposed to referring exclusively to Jacob. It's the first mention of that. Um, Again, verse 8 through 10, Pharaoh's fear was Israel's numbers. Um, There is strength in numbers, um, as we see here, uh, and Pharaoh knew it. So his goal was to oppress them so that they would fear his power, the power of Egypt. So uh, the plan is, is to put taskmasters over them, enslave them, make their labor so horrible that they detest life and that they, they are held under in power and, in, in, and are controlled, which didn't work. Uh, in fact, they just, as the Bible says, they just flourished. So then we have the store cities of Pithom and Ramesses. Pithom and Ramesses, I don't know how you pronounce that. Pithom, Pithom. Um, these are actual locations that were uh, where provisions were kept, perhaps armaments were kept there as well. Um, biblicalarchaeology.org is a phenomenal resource. Um, this is the Associates for Biblical Research. That's their website is biblicalarchaeology.org. They also produce a, I believe it's quarterly publication called Bible and Spade. This is where you can see um, and learn about biblical archaeology from actual scientists, archaeologists that go and are doing active digs. In fact, I did an interview uh, with a biblical archaeologist uh, who actually excavated um, Jericho, among other sites. Uh, That's on Apostle Talk. I'll put a link to that video at the end of this so you can watch that interview. It is absolutely fascinating. As time progresses, we are digging and we are discovering more and more and more and more Uh, artifacts and things that validate our scripture as being factual. Uh, And these two cities they have found, and I'm going to include in the YouTube description down below, I will include a hyperlink to an article on um, BibleArchaeology.org that specifically talks about the uh, store cities and where they were and what their purposes were. It's fascinating stuff. It informs Uh, our text to be able to look and see uh, as they dig up how these people lived and it it brings to light our text. Continuing on, verse 14, bitter. The bitter life that the Israelites, Israelites had will actually be represented in the Passover meal. This is an example where application, uh, every single piece of the Passover meal is significant, and we will go through that when we hit chapter 12 and we talk about the Passover uh, meal. So now let's uh, read the rest of this chapter, uh, verse 15 through 22. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, Verse uh, 19 
is the first example. Well, let's talk about the, the, the Hebrew midwives just real quick. Um, I didn't put that note here. But uh, two midwives are mentioned, but it's likely that it wasn't just two women who were responsible for uh, helping the um, Hebrew women give birth, but these two women were the overseers, uh, Shifra and Pua, um, were the overseers. Now, the command that they're given is, um, if it's a baby boy, to kill him. The goal here is, is that uh, to bring the numbers of the uh, Israelites down in a logical way is to remove the threat of um, future potential uh, mutinies um, or, or male Hebrew men that can come up and take arms against uh, Egypt. But we see in uh, uh, 17, the midwives feared God and did not do what the king uh, had told them to do. Uh, verse 19 is the first example of civil disobedience in the Bible. The women make up this story uh, about the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before midwives. Um, and this is an interesting thing to talk about. Is Romans 13 tell us that we ought to obey human authority? An example that I want to flip to of this, um, or uh, further insight in this, is in the book of Acts. So flip with me to Acts uh, chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse uh, 29. Acts chapter 5. Actually, we're going to pick it up on uh, verse 27. Acts chapter 5, verse 27. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He's referring to Jesus. Not to teach in Jesus' name. He said, Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. We are, as those verses mentioned, um, the Bible does tell us to respect authority and follow the law of the land so long as it doesn't go against God's decree. So, uh, the midwives feared God, so they didn't kill off the Egyptian boys. So what does Pharaoh do? Um, he expands, uh, rather than putting just the midwives in charge of killing the Hebrew baby boys, he expands and makes it a decree um, for all people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let, let every girl live. Now, this is the perfect setup for um, Moses being born and uh, uh, Exodus chapter 2, in which Moses is put into a, a basket in the Nile to save his life. Um, but this decree that Pharaoh gives is um, probably familiar to some. Uh, King Herod, when Jesus was a baby, this is documented in Matthew 2.16, um, he's speaking to the Magi and trying to determine um, where this new king of the Israelites is to be born and when he's to be born. And he says, so that I can go and worship him. Uh, but it's, it's similar where the king is threatened uh, and he's threatened about this um, Jewish Messiah that has been prophesied. And so as the story in uh, Matthew 2.16 documents, Herod gave the command to kill all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem that were two years and younger. Uh, thankfully, um, God through an angel spoke to uh, Joseph and, and to, to take Mary and baby Jesus and go down to Egypt for a period of time until uh, the heat dies off um, from Herod. Just interesting parallels that are there. Now, another thing to note, this decree... Um, 
it might have been rescinded or not followed or just not pushed because we know as the story continues in uh, Exodus 2 that there are Hebrew men that are around the same age as Moses. We do not know how many uh, Hebrews died uh, in this decree given by Pharaoh to kill every single Hebrew boy. We'll pick up on Exodus chapter 2 and the story of Moses uh, being born all the way to him fleeing um, to Midian. Uh, but I don't want to get ahead on that. So application. Where's God in this? God hasn't been mentioned. Uh, the Israelites, uh, it, it'll tell us uh, later on that 430 years, the Israelites were in Egypt. And we, we learn next week at the end um, of the chapter, uh, it says, God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. So at the end of next week, God does come into the scene and, and the Bible says that God remembered. We'll talk about that, of what that means. Um, but that's, that's the question as far as application. So where is God in all of this? God clearly orchestrated for Israel as a nation to be saved from the plague that was coming, not the plague, but the, the famine on the land that was going to ravage everywhere. Uh, God saved both Egypt as well as Israel as a nation uh, through using Joseph and bringing um, Israel down into Egypt. But as they're sitting here with their slave masters' whips hitting their back, the people no doubt are asking the question, where is God? He promised us that he would remember us and that he would come and rescue us. Where is he? Where is he? And that's the application for today. Whether you individually are in a time uh, where you feel God's absence or as a nation, we're asking this question of where is God? This text was written, uh, Moses' hand penned it, the Holy Spirit inspired it, but it was a reminder for the people of Israel. And it was used as a reminder of God's remembrance and that he will rescue his people. It was used in Isaiah. So uh, during the time of the captivity in Babylon, Isaiah was a prophet. And he wrote specifically about uh, the captivity that they had and were experiencing Babylon. Isaiah referenced back to Exodus as a reminder, hundreds and hundreds of years later, as a reminder for Israel of God's fulfillment of his promise and his uh, rescuing and his um, restoring the people of Israel as he promised that he would. Why don't we actually flip to Isaiah 43 and we're going to read the words that Isaiah uh, writes um, and references uh, Exodus. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. We're going to hit all the way over on verse 16, but I want to read all of Isaiah 43. And I have no idea how we're doing on time, but this is all good stuff. So bear with me. Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight. And because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. 
Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble, which are their gods foretold, which of their gods foretold this proclaimed to us the former things. Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witness, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act. When Who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians. In the ships in which they took pride, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Verse 16 and 17 are direct reference to Exodus and the story of Israel uh, being led through the parting of the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his chariots following after, never to be seen again. They were engulfed by the waters of the Red Sea. And in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. That's also a reference, um, potentially, I don't know it for certain, Verse 16 and 17 are clear. Verse 2, as you pass through the waters, makes sense that that's talking also about the part in the Red Sea, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. I believe that is a reference to Joshua and when the people crossed over the Jordan River and the Jordan River parted for them in the same way, where they crossed on dry ground. Isaiah uses this as a reference the story of Exodus as a reminder that God is sovereign. Romans 8, 28, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So stay the course. As we look at our nation, as you look at your life, if you're going through a trial right now, think about Joseph. I love to look at the story of Joseph for a man who went through horrible trials. His brothers hated him, wanted to kill him. He sold as a slave. That time that he was sold as a slave and served in Potiphar's house, he was a slave. But it was a time, a, a, a hard time of torment that he went through, but God had a plan for his life. Same thing when he was accused of rape by Potiphar's wife and he ends up in prison. He was in prison for years and years and years and years and years. He made the best of the situation and God lifted him up and he was in charge of the whole prison. But he was there intentionally so that when Pharaoh had the dream, the cupbearer would remember that Joseph had uh, interpreted through God the cupbearer's dream and he would call Joseph before Pharaoh. Think about that. The, the application of Exodus as we look at the beginning first chapter, God's not mentioned, but God is there. And he is preparing, we'll talk about it more, that there's a reason why Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. There's a reason why God had them there, and he didn't forget them. And as you look at our world today, uh, the seas are warming, there's fires everywhere, uh, as you look at life, political craziness, God is still in charge. God is still sovereign. 
And we know what's going to happen at the end. In fact, uh, one of my favorite verses um, is from 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow or slack in keeping his promises, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. In fact, let's, let's flip, flip there. This is going to be the last verse um, that we go to, but uh, go with me to 2 Peter. It's at the end of your Bible. Uh, it's one of the uh, latter epistles. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. As you look at our world as it is now, these are growing pains. Uh, excuse me, birthing pains. The end is coming. And I know, I mean, you hear that. The end is near. Repent. It's so true. We are in the last days. There's no question of that. And it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And you can, you can bank on that. So the, the global warming is going to get worse. In fact, I do believe in global warning, warming. Uh, Second Peter is going to explain how our world is going to end. It's going to get very, very hot. So in looking at like politics, that if you get your pharaoh, your president, that you want to be elected, if you get him elected, well, then that will solve things. That'll help issues. And, and you're obsessed with politics. Of The only way we can solve this is get the right people elected. Yeah, I mean, you should still vote and vote for moral, ethical people uh, if you can find them. But God is sovereign. God is in control. Okay, uh, I could talk for hours. Let's read this and then we'll wrap up. So I'm going to read um, 2 Peter uh, 3 is phenomenal. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you of wholesome thinking to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everyone goes on as, as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed in the flood. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. I do believe in global warming. Being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will despair with a roar, disappear, excuse me. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That's your application right there. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, I love that, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the air of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So that wraps up Exodus chapter 1. 
I invite you to join me every week. These videos are going to air on Wednesday night at 7 p.m., but you can find them. They'll always be uh, up on YouTube as well as on ironsheep.org. You can also listen to each of these studies. The ideal way in my mind to experience these studies is with your Bible out and a pen taking notes either in your Bible or in a notebook. But if you are busy and you simply want to listen to these as you're driving, that's phenomenal. You will still hear the word read and you will hear the insight uh, of the scripture giving inference on the scripture. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I absolutely love the fact that this is our 200th video to go up on our YouTube channel. Uh, in July of 2020 was when the first video went up. We had no followers, no subscribers. Now, I do believe before September is done, we might crest over a thousand, and our 200th video is this one today. I think it's really cool. I invite you to join with me as we dig into scripture. You can also find these and listen to these on uh, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcasts. I'll include a link below uh, to those spots. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you will ignite a fire in each person that is listening or watching right now of a hunger for you, a hunger uh, in them to invite you into their lives, to change them from the inside out. Give them courage to know that no matter how hard things are, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death even, you are there in the midst. You anoint our head with oil, and surely goodness and gladness will follow, and mercy will follow all the days of our lives. You are God, you are sovereign, and we love you, and we are here to study your word. Thank you for this time. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me for week one. I'll see you next week. Oh, I should introduce the dogs. <laughs> uh, below me is Kenzie, uh, and then over here, um, I believe you can see her in the shadow over there, is Lexi. And uh, I don't know where Miss Jasmine is. She is the little um, cavapoo that my wife uh, brought home when I was in Africa last year. So these are the pups. They joined me. Um, yeah. So there you go. That's the end. <laughs> oh, Jasmine's coming. Come, okay, Jasmine's coming. Come here, Jazz. Come here, Jasmine. Yes. Okay. Ah, so this is Miss Jasmine. She is the cavapoo that uh, absolutely runs the show, don't you? Yes, she is our director. <laughs> I love you guys. I'll see you next week.